Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this afternoon it's Friday and I'm joined by Lloyd Patrick Jepson. It's the final discussion before the pre-match bulletin on Sunday morning. It'll be half past 11 and uh, we're sitting here after a wee night in Glasgow last night. Lloyd, I think you and I were the sensible ones because we seem a bit fresh this morning after uh, this bulletin. I'll be Going through to Grangemouth, it was all about Paddy McCourt last night. We're going to start off with Paddy. Uh, Paddy was outstanding last night. Somebody on the uh, social said that he's got as much talent on the mic as he does with a ball. Not sure about that, but uh, he was Great outstanding. Ball, but, but, he was brilliant, uh, wasn't he? Oh, it was, it was excellent. The stories I could tell last night, he had us all in stitches. And even backstage as well, some of the stuff. When he was letting people just come in and that, telling stories. It, what a class guy he is. He's so down to earth as well. You He's don't realise it. He really is brilliant. brilliant. And he I know you've great. got a gig with him later on today as well. So hopefully that all goes well, the same as what last night did. Yeah, I mean, with regards to live events, I know that a lot of the people who tune into Axon who are not Scottish based um, have asked time and time again about us maybe you know streaming these live. Uh, but these types of interviews are a slightly different thing. I mean, the first thing we say when we go on the stage, no phones. We don't want anybody mm-hmm. filming us because what happens is you know, the guest clams up a wee bit, Lloyd. And it's not about anything dodgy getting said on the stage, but you want them to relax. So there has been one occasion um, where you and me, Albie, where we filmed it. We put it out live and it's on the channel. And it gives you an idea of what we do when we take um, Axon out on the road and, and why do we do it. Well, there was a there was a want. People were asking for it. And on the night, I think it's a great occasion. It's a great opportunity to get a couple of hundred Celtic fans under the same roof the atmosphere last night was brilliant. Can I just say that the, the venue, Gracie's, or the staff at Gracie's, absolutely brilliant. We would recommend it. Um, and there was a right good vibe going into the weekend. This is the thing I took away from it. I'm driving home last night, saying to the missus, what a good atmosphere. Everybody seemed to be pretty positive, Lloyd. Yeah, um, they, did. they did, didn't they? they and I mean, really I, I think also it gives you an opportunity to have a look at the old uh, Axon merchandise, which Lloyd is sporting just now. We get a wee bit of light on that T-shirt. Look at that. Barrafield. We like it. We like it a lot. There's only one discussion. We've spoken about the uh, referee uh, who has been allocated this particular match. We have spoken about comments in the mainstream media regarding uh, hate speech on Sunday. Right? We've spoken all around that. We've spoken about patterns of assistance. We took a deep dive on Friday of last week. 26,000 people have tuned into that on YouTube. Another 5,000 on the audios. Um, people are interested in hearing what Alan's got to say about a pattern of assistance when it comes to one club in Scottish football. But it all whittles down to Sunday now. And we know there's no fans there. We know who's in charge in terms of the officials. Um, and it comes down to the team selection. It comes down to the shape of the team. And it comes down to the approach. Um, siege mentality, Lloyd. What do you think about a siege mentality when the chips are down and everybody's against you? Sometimes it works in your favour. See, I, I, I think I spoke to Lawrence about this last night. See, when it's a seized mental, mentality for Celtic and our backs are against the wall, it seems everything goes against us. That's when we're at our best. I feel I feel when the chips are down, we come out fighting. And I hope and I pray that that's what we do at 12 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Because to quote the Stone Roses here, this really is the one on oh, Sunday. Yeah. You can quote the Stone Roses anytime you want on a Celtic state of mind. Um, we're going to be talking right through the team. The big story, of course, this morning is that uh, Callum McGregor made it to training. We're going to start with Callum McGregor. Um, we spoke actually last night, just going to tie it mm-hmm. into a discussion. And, and the reason I do this isn't to name drop, it's just that, and I've said this before, if I speak to anybody who's involved in football in any way, shape or form, be that as a player, as a coach, scout, data analyst, author, journalist, whatever, I really want to pick their brains, Lloyd. I want to get as much information as I possibly can because I've not seen behind the curtain. I don't know what goes on at Lennox Town. I don't know what goes on in the dressing room. Um, you don't want to know what goes on in a dressing room that, <laughs> that involves Scott Brown, by the way. No, Maybe Paddy don't. will tell that story of the night again. But we did speak about Paddy because um, Paddy was coming to the end of his Celtic career and, and he saw a young Callum McGregor coming through. And he spoke about McGregor, didn't he? Um, I think the question was around young guys coming through who maybe mm-hmm. didn't kick on. And the player that he spoke about who came through and showed loads of great promise, didn't kick on, was uh, Islam Farouz. He goes, you know, he was training with us when he was 15, training with the first team. Um, he saw James A. Forrest coming through. And, he, and his point that he made on James A. Forrest was instantly, 
the first team squad knew this boy's going to be he's going to be a first team player. And, and what he said, Lloyd, was he didn't know what kind of impact, and he certainly didn't know that 15 seasons later he would still be playing. But he knew he would be a first team player. He wasn't sure about Callum McGregor, was he? No, he wasn't sure, and that's what I kind of took away from last night. And that when obviously you look at the way Callum plays now and everything and how he leads the team. It, we all seen that when we became captain as well. We weren't some of us weren't sure obviously if he had that captain material in him. But when you look back at start his career and before he scored that goal against KR Reykjavik, which was his first goal, then you're thinking, is he actually ever going to break into this team? Because obviously he had the loan spelled out, not as far no not not as county it was, sorry. And he kicked on down there a little bit and then came back up and Centroni Dial put him in the team, he grabbed his chance. But if Paddy McCoach even turned around saying he couldn't see it when he was younger, then you've got to kind of wonder, what was he actually doing that the first team guys didn't see that he would possibly make it? And then how has he turned into this player that he is today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting now, to, to totally qualify this, Paddy McCourt thinks Callum McGregor's a sensational footballer. Mm-hmm. He thinks he's developed into... You know, a, an absolutely, you know, a rock in the Celtic team, which he has, and he's a fantastic captain. Um, and I mentioned last night, you know, that 500 club, he's going to be the next guy in the history of Celtic to enter um, that very exclusive club of only 12 Celtic players who have made 500 or more appearances. Um, I feel sorry for the guys who probably played before things like Europe and, and uh, the League Cup, and they played at a time, Jimmy McGrory, for example, is not in that mm-hmm. list. You know, they, they guys played at a time when the Glasgow Cup and the Glasgow Charities Cup were, were competitive tournaments, but in the record books, they're not included with appearances, which is just, I, I think it's a bit unfortunate for some of the younger Celts, uh, younger in terms of in the olden days, let's just say, the black and white Celts. Uh, but Callum McGregor will be joining that 500 t- uh, club, as will, I'm guessing, Jamesy Forrest. Um, but he did speak about uh, Callum, and, and he spoke about the fact that he didn't make that instant impact. The other guy I, I have spoken to in relation to McGregor coming through was one of his coaches when he was uh, playing uh, as a youth, and the coach uh, was George McCluskey, former Celtic player George McCluskey, um, who famously scored that goal in the 1980 Scottish Cup final, which uh, you know resulted in a riot, and that's why 44 years later we can't have a pint at the football in Scotland. Maybe sometime in my lifetime that will change. But George was saying that when he was kind of coaching young Callum, um, every time he got the ball within 20, 25 miles, he wanted to put the laces through it, uh, Lloyd. And, and mm-hmm. inadvertently, the ball would, he would do a maida. It would land somewhere, but it wouldn't be in the net. And George took him to the side and worked with him one-to-one and spoke about you know, the importance of the accuracy and spoke about you know how to place a ball, but do that with the same level of power. And when you watch a lot of the, the goals that McGregor scored for Celtic, it's just that, you know, the, the, the shot itself is, is a thunderbolt. It's a, I bet it's a place shot. But he's placed it. Aye. And I, and I always think back to that George McCluskey chat that I had around about the time George released his book. And I think about it and I think, you know, at, at a young age, somebody's identified, that's a bit of a failing in the player. Let's make it right. And all these years later, McGregor still is making it right. But we're going to start with Callum. We know how pivotal he has been um, since he broke through you know, as a player, but definitely since he was given that captain's armband under Ange. Um, he's had a few spells through injury. Obviously, the, the cheekbone fracture was the worst, and then he comes back as soon as he possibly can. He wears the face mask, and uh, he's as effective with it as he, as he is without it. Um, so I'm going to give you my take, Lloyd. You know, mm-hmm. the big question is, should he start, should he not? The very fact that he's training today, right, doesn't mean he's fit enough to start the game. Now, even if he's fit enough to be on the bench, that would suggest he's not sharp enough to start the game because he's been out, obviously, for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But having Callum McGregor in that hotel on Saturday night, because I'm guessing it'll be Saturday night that they do their overnight stay, and the preparation and, you know, the meeting that they're going to have probably after training today, maybe tomorrow at some point, and then the travel, even the travel on that bus to the game, to have Callum McGregor as part of that. And then in the dressing room, even if he's on the bench, he's still the captain, you know, and the, the team chop before the game. I know that Ange Postacoglu said that there was a domain of the players. He would leave and he would leave it to the likes of Callum McGregor, uh, Joe Hart, these types of players who would step up. Mm-hmm. He's still going to do that. It doesn't matter if he's 
starting the game or not, he's going to still do that. At half time, regardless of how the game's going, he's still going to have the same influence. And if we're able to bring him on for 30 or 25 minutes uh, to make that influence near the end of the game, brilliant. But I still think the very fact he's involved is as good a boost as anything because actually in the midfield, Lloyd, we're pretty well covered at the moment. Yeah, we are. And just obviously before we came on live, I kind of spoke to you about the options and that that we've got in midfield now. And it's probably the strongest it has been all season because you've got Hattati back, you've got Bernardo, O'Reilly, who's obviously scored and still. You've got Awata, who's... He's not done anything wrong in my eyes, apart from obviously that poor pass back against Hearts. Then obviously you've got Carl McGregor back. You've got James McCarthy lingering somewhere in Lennox Town, which I will admit I did write a team at the start of the week and James McCarthy was in it, but it was kind of tongue in cheek. So that's all I'll say about that one. What does he do week day to day? I mean, listen, he's a great guy in the dressing room. He's uh, a great guy in the dressing room. That's what it is. He plays the Doms, he gets the calves. No, but the, the thing with um, McCarthy, you've diverted my attention to James McCarthy because I do wonder about guys like him. I saw yesterday a wee guy up at Lennox Town. It might have been this morning, actually. It might have been me, actually. <laughs> I'm getting their balls signed, right? <laughs> and one, one of the guys that stopped was Benji Segrist. I'm thinking, Benji Segrist, who's in the back? Who's in the boot? Is James McCarthy in the boot? Is y- Yuki Kobayashi in there? These guys, are, they're never seen. No. And, you know, they're, they're professional footballers. It's not healthy. This is my point, Lloyd. It's not healthy for them not to have any kind of football in their legs for months. So, you know, for, for the entirety of the season. I mean, Kobe Ash has not played under Brendan Rodgers, has he? He played in a, a pre-season game, I think. Pre-season, yeah. Yeah, but he's not played competitively. Japan, no. Yeah, no, Benji Segrist never kicked the ball. James McCarthy never kicked the ball. This type of thing is not healthy. It's not healthy for the players. And I don't think it's healthy for the squad. And, you know, it's something that Brendan Rodgers has spoken about, trimming the squad. But... Back to the point, I'm going to bring in some of the comments here because I think some people look at that tagline and say, that's a no-brainer. If Callum McGregor's fit to play, plays. But I think there's a consideration in terms of the balance of that midfield. If he's 100% match sharp, he plays. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be putting somebody in that's not. And certainly not uh, Callum McGregor. You look at some of the guys who have been playing in his absence. Tomoki Awata. We had been talking about giving him a run of games. He's, he's finally got it. And I agree with you. I think other than that slight indiscretion at Tynecastle where he's lost the ball, they scored a goal that was chopped off. That was the one thing that stood out for me. But generally and largely speaking, he's breaking up attacks. He's doing that type of job. Um, nothing fancy. He can go through a game and there's maybe not a, a defence splitting pass, uh, mm-hmm. Lloyd, but he's doing a job that you know allows, I think, the freedom uh, of a player like Leo Atati or, or Matt O'Reilly. So he's very good at that. And if we start on Sunday and, and Awata is playing in that defensive midfield role, I'm happy with that because it simply means Callum McGregor's not 100% sharp. And the medical team have said, listen, he's got 30 minutes in his legs or 35 or whatever it might be. But as I say, the influence will still be there straight from the moment they get to the hotel for the for the, for the the match, you know, everything. The, the, the morning breakfast, that whole thing, Callum McGregor being part of that, is absolutely huge. And then, with regards to the rest of that midfield, I honestly believe it picks itself. I know that Bernardo yeah. had a good run at the uh, NDV 2023. He, he did. He had a brilliant run. He was For me, he was the main man against Rangers in the last fixture. But we're not picking the team on the last fixture. We're picking it on form. And last week, Rio Tati gave us a massive boost when we saw his picture on that start in 11 that Celtic released on the social media channels. And he was brilliant. It's not like, it's like, you know, he came back and he played the way he's been playing, largely under Brennan Rogers. He was brilliant at the weekend. And I know it was only Livingston and they're no great, but it's his first game back. And I think he starts, and I think O'Reilly, he's coming for a lot of stick. But between him and Joe Hart, for me, is Celtic's player of the year this season. Yeah. Um, you can have dips in form when your form has been so good, Lloyd. And against Rangers as well, when you're looking at a tight game, a compact game, when it might come down to that defence split and pass, we've seen it so often from Rio and from Matt O'Reilly. You know, so that's my take on it. Listen, if I see that start at 11 and McGregor's in it, great, because you trust the medical team and you say, well, he's fit to play. That gives every, everybody a boost. Let's have a wee look, though, at uh, some of the thoughts coming in from the viewers. And thanks, everybody, for continually tuning in. We're a 1,000 strong here on a Friday afternoon. 
And we've been getting uh, a lot of yous in all week. It's been uh, great. There's been loads of brilliant discussion points. Anything else you wish to d- discuss before the game, bring it up in the comments section. And um, because it's something of a tradition, I'm going to bring in Jungle Lion first. All right, here we go. Big caution. Have two not fully fit midfielders, but I take the risk. Now, we're referring, of course, to Rio, who's just back, and I think it's a good point. It's a very, very good point. Rio is obviously that wee bit further ahead in his um, rehabilitation, Lloyd, than Callum. So you've, you've not really got as much concerns about Rio. But as Jungle Lion says, you bring somebody else back in who's maybe not 100%. And that could that could prove a risk. This game can be won and lost in the midfield, and we've seen it. Do you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, 100%. That consideration? Yeah, 100%. Um, these are the games that midfields generally do wins. So with that... <laughs> You could take the risk on it and it could pay off, but you could also take the risk and it might fall flat in your face. So that is obviously the thing that you've got to consider. Brendan Rodgers, today and tomorrow, has probably got the toughest decision to any manager in Scotland because he's got all his midfielders fit now. Whether Callum McGregor's fit for 30 minutes, 25 minutes, the fact you've got Callum McGregor fit for that period of time and you could use him. You've got Rio Hattati, who could who'd done 60 minutes on Sunday. And then obviously played forty five minute bounce game. These options, these are the options that we wanted. We spoke about quality all season. There's your quality right there. You've got Cal, you've got Awata, you've got Bernardo, you've got O'Reilly. They are all quality quality options in that middle of that park. And I, really I, I could pick the Rangers midfield if I wanted right now because I, I just think that's predictable. But I think now we are midfield. It's unpredictable. If you if everybody's one hundred percent fit, it is Cal. Hattati and O'Reilly for me, but you can't discount Bernardo and Amata. They've been doing the business when they've been out. They've done they've done really well. I think the, the two things I'll always go back to is if possible, do not play a player out of position. And if possible, mm-hmm. do not play someone who's not 100 percent fit. Now obviously I'm I'm guessing, I'm surmising here, Callum would be doing gym work and this is I'm just back on the grass now. So obviously he's been working on his fitness. Uh, but it's that sharpness, isn't it, to get back on the park? And I don't know if they'll have him back in tomorrow for a session. Um, but I'm pretty sure Brennan Rogers will be quizzed on all of these things and more in the pre-match press conference today. Uh, big shout out, actually, for the uh, the documentary team who came along last night. Th- this is the bizarre thing. Nothing, I take nothing for granted, Lloyd. Right, and uh, coming into that that event last night, we had been about a month ago contacted by um, a German documentary. Uh, Team and they wanted to come along and they wanted to meet us as Celtic supporters and act some and, and speak to us about the derby and the lead up to the, the big game. And then they stuck around and they filmed a wee bit, obviously, with everybody singing Paddy's song as he came on the stage, got a wee bit of uh, footage of Paddy on the stage and stuff like that. And they were just intrigued about this, this derby that's obviously got a global reputation and they wanted to dig a wee bit deeper into what makes it so special, what makes it different. Um, so yeah, big shout out to them, they were brilliant, really superb. They did get me to do one shot that I, I felt like a tube outside the actual venue, and there was a big queue of people, uh, all shouting abuse at me. And they were doing this thing, I had to kind of look, stare into the distance, and everything else. Hopefully, that's not used. Paddy Lavery, afternoon to you as well. I was talking to uh, Paddy McCourt about Ardoin last night, um, and I told him all about yourself. Floyd was sitting there at the time. Who's the snitch? Hail, hail, gentlemen, hail, hail to you as well, half hail, hail. man. Half pie, still love that. That's if, brilliant. I'm trying to stay off the pies, actually. Um, I was talking about that last night. I'm trying yeah, to stay off are. the pies. Yeah, absolutely. There comes a certain time in your life where you've got to watch everything you ingest because there is no hiding place. If McGregor is fit, he plays. We should always play the best team possible. I agree with that. We don't know his fitness. I mean, when Brendan Rodgers talks about a, a player coming back, and he spoke about uh, Carter Vickers like this, Someone in the comments will be able to tell me exactly. Carl Vickers appeared and then played. Rio Atati appeared and then played. You know, it's not as though they're training for two weeks before the gaffer thinks or the medical team thinks, right, he's fit, he's good to go, Lloyd. The very fact that's maybe just his first training session on the grass, they might say, well, he's done everything in terms of his gym work. We've, we've tested the injury. We've te- everything has reacted, you know, positively. There might be another wee session tomorrow. And maybe they'll make or break the that will make or break the decision tomorrow. But it will be huge either way. I think even the fact that their pictures are released this morning, uh, the social media team know what they're doing, don't they? They're just uh, yeah, drop, dropping a wee grenade in there 
Um, I, I think we all got a bit of a boost when we seen that this morning, though. Definitely. Because, because it was the one question on everybody's lips. Is he fit? And you've seen him on the training pitch today now. So whether he's fit, fully, or match fit, he's he's on that training pitch. So he's an option to come up either off the bench or start the game. Play a part. And, and you know what? I want him to come off the bench. I want him to, to play a part on the part. But as I said before, and I'm going to stick to that, I think the influence will be there. He will play a part regardless. You know, he will have a huge influence uh, with regards to the, the team. You look at some of the guys who have either not played many games like this or will be making their Glasgow Derby debut. Um, the big one for me, obviously, would, would be Kuhn. Just uh, on that, know, well John, it is called the Glasgow Derby, isn't it? Because well, it I, is. I'm sure some commentators said you can call it whatever you like. That's uh, right. I'm sure it's Glasgow Derby, just for clarification on that. Well, these are the things, right, I've got to say, right, when you're speaking to someone who's not got any skin in the game, as in last night when we were talking to the guys from Germany, uh, they were from Hamburg, and, and one of their two daughters actually played for St. Pauli, a ladies' team. So I was having a wee chat with him about Jackson Irvine and cult players because they didn't have a good knowledge of who Paddy was. So I was trying to explain who Paddy McCourt was to them before we, we started chatting. And I said, you know, Jackson Irvine, because he had told me about his, his kids playing for the St. Pauli team. And they were like, oh, yeah. I was like, you know, he's a bit of cult player. He's got that relationship with the fans and all this. I said, that's Paddy. Paddy's got that. Um, and there was big canvases, actually, of Paddy McCourt celebrating the goal against St. Pauli in the centenary game. But um, that was one of the things I said before. And I goes, listen, uh, I don't know if anybody's actually told you what the crack is here when it comes to the terminology used when we're talking about this game. I said, we, it's not the old firm. The old firm, that died in 2012. Oh, oh he said, listen. We've been told all about that. We know all about that, he says, you know. So, um, yeah, they did refer to it as the Glasgow Derby, uh, which was interesting. Joe Hamilton, if Cal Mack starts, he has what it takes to take it right to them. Um, there's that wee snippet of footage uh, where Callum, with the Phantom of the Opera mask, um, shouts something. I don't know if he was, it was a, a, a positive message he was shouting or he was trying to G up Barisic. I'm not quite sure. I'm not very good at the old um, lip reading, Lloyd, but I've seen that this morning. And that yeah. shows you what, you know, he can get in about them. It's true what Joe says. Sometimes you need a play like that. I think the other occasion that springs to my mind, other than goals, etc., that he scored, was when we went a goal down at Ibrox. Mm -hmm. And it was Aaron Ramsey, wasn't it? Scored Aye, an early yeah. goal. That's and, right. Logic and Carter Vickers brought the game back. Yeah. The performance yeah. in McGregor that day, right? You'll, I'm not talking. Um, defence splitting passes or any of that kind of stuff. The captain's role that he played that day was the best I've seen from yeah. Callum McGregor. And this is what I'm talking about. A guy who can just grab other players and raise their levels. And I think sometimes regardless of how good you are, this game can pass you by, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. So you look at a player like um, Kuhn, and we're going to be talking about him because this will be his first experience of this, right? We've looked at Kuhn, he's been criticised for his uh, initial appearances with Celtic and instantly people are saying, oh, wait a minute, he's, played, he's, he's been with quite a few big clubs before. Is there something missing in his makeup that doesn't allow him to perform for a big club? You know, got all the talent in the world, but there's a mentality. There comes a point where you've got to be able to, to step into a game like this and still perform. And those, those doubts, unfairly, as it turns out, started to rear their heads when he, he wasn't playing so well. So guys like Callum McGregor and James E. Forrest mm -hmm. are absolutely key for someone like Nicholas Kuhn at the weekend, aren't they? Yeah, 100%. It's, these are the, the games where guys like Joe Hart, Callum and James Forrest, not McCarthy, can all have a wee word with like Nicholas Kuhn, Palma, yeah, Ida. Well, Ida kind of probably knows anyway what this game's about, but these are the, the games where this is where you're relying your experienced players. They tell you what it's all about. They guide you through the game. This is 90 minutes on Sunday that we either we need to win or take something from, no matter what. And this is where I'm relying on those guys on that pitch to do that for us. Because we are not in the stadium to back the team. Yep. So it has to be on the management team and also on the experienced players to guide the inexperienced players in this fixture. Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely. I think, you know, and I've said this before, and it's not favouritism, I think Tony Ralston's one of those players as well. And, you know, again, going back to what I said at the top of the show, Lloyd, when I'm speaking to anybody who know, 
a hell of a lot more about football than I do. I always pick their brains about things like this, you know. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have a core group of young, um, homegrown players? Players who have maybe been at the club from the age of seven, eight. Um, and by the time they make their debut, they're already, you know, within the fabric of the club. They know the mentality that it takes um, to, to be a winner. The mentality, the mentality that, that it takes that a 0-0 zero, zero draw is catastrophic at times. We've seen mm -hmm. it this season, right? Uh, we've, we've drawn a game and there's booze at the end of the game. It takes a certain type of character to to be able to deal with that. I think, not always, but I think guys coming through are well equipped for that because they've seen it. And every single coach they've, they've had at every single level throughout the system, of, with, throughout the development plan, has absolutely you know, drummed that and drilled that into them from day one. So I think very naturally a lot of these guys, like Ralston, Forrest and McGregor, have got it. I'm not saying that it's every one of them's got it um, because a lot of people said Mikey Johnson maybe didn't have it. He maybe didn't have the mentality to, to be a Celtic player. He goes to West Brom and he starts flying. He plays for Ireland and he, and he plays with the freedom, the shackles are off. So it doesn't always work, but I think the guys we've mentioned are very important in that respect. Now, what I want to hear from uh, the uh, commenters and everybody viewing this particular show is what are you doing for the game on Sunday? Because you're not going to be at it, right? Or are you? Because somebody has contacted me about the lockout game back in the 90s. And they were saying, ah, we were at the game, man. And they found a way to get in. I've also been contacted by somebody who managed to get uh, into the behind-closed-door game against Atletico Madrid in the 1980s. So people always find a way, right, to get in. Um, so let us know how you're going to be enjoying the game on Sunday. Lloyd, hopefully you've got the day off. Hopefully you will be able to watch the game. How are you going to enjoy I, it? I do have the day off. Um, I've got my son on that day, so I think both me and him will chill out and watch the game together in, in the house. Well, with, no with no sherbets or nothing, just nice and cool and calm. Both, and bottles, bottles and pies. Uh, do you know pie, about that? I was saying this to somebody in work the other day. I've never actually had a bovril. Oh, come on. Never had a bovril. Had plenty of pies, hence why I've had to lose the weight. But Bovril's right. My best, my, my first experience of bovril, right, because it's a Scottish staple of football, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. My first um, my first taste of bovril was at Tyne Castle. This is, this is a true story, isn't it? And we were rotten, right? And, and there's people in the comment section will remember this game. This is the game um, where I was obsessed with not the view fans. I also used to pick up once a Tim and a few of the other Irish ones that were getting sold out to the stadiums and stuff. But the not the view was so influential, right? And every so often, something would happen and you're thinking, that's because people have read this in not the view or something, Lloyd, right? Yeah. But I remember at Tyne Castle that day, Celtic fans, we got beat 3-1, by the way. It was one nothing, And then I think Tommy Coyne scored the equaliser, right? And, and, and Hearts, I almost said Rangers there, a wee slip. <laughs> Ray, Hearts then beat us 3-1. And they beat us well, right? And the Celtic fans, horrible, stinking night. It was like November or something, right? The Celtic fans were singing, always look on the bright side, right? The proper Monty Python, you know, self-deprecating humour uh, often that you see at the football. And that was the first time I, I, I tasted and sampled this uh, Scottish drink, the Bovril, right? And what happened is my old man went up, got a couple of pies, a couple of bottles, down he comes, right? Spilling them on his hands and all that. Because you never used to get the fancy trays back then, did you? You know, that you get yeah. for costas and stuff. And I'm looking at this pie, this thing in my hand, and it's it's almost liquefied with grease. It's, it's horrendous. But I'm hungry and cold, right? So I'm using the bottle as a heat. And this is no lies. I turn around and there's this guy, a fellow Celtic fan in the crowd. And he does that with a pie, and the grease rolls and drips into his bovril, and he kind of shiggles it about a wee bit, and then drinks it. And I'm going, "This is Scottish football. This is what we live for, right?" Cardiac, a cardiac. Honestly, on a Saturday afternoon, there you go. And the pie was rotten. Don't even think I finished it. But the bovril, the bovril remains, and I do like a bovril from time to time. Sorry, I digress, but it is a Scottish staple. Lloyd, you must get the bovrils, and you can buy them from the supermarket these days. Get the bottles okay. in. I'll need to get Introdu the bottles in. Introduce the wee guy to it, the Scottish <laughs> delicacy. I know. Bottle bells have not had a bottle. Shocking. 
I know, it is at your age. How and where are you enjoying the game? Oh my God, look at that. Yuck. <laughs> um, it's a true story and it was a Celtic. Are, are you out there? Did you survive? <laughs> what a diet that was. Um, here we go. Patrick McLaughlin, a wee bovro with two sachets of pepper. Mm, would be good today in this weather. It is. See, sometimes, mate, see, like, just to have a hot drink, get yourself a bovro, man. It's like, it's like an oxo cube in hot water. That's what it tastes like. Can you imagine putting an oxo? That's what it tastes like. Joseph McGonagall was at the game. Was it you with the pie, though, Joseph? Was it you? Admit it. Mm. Did you add the additional ingredients into the bottle to make it taste better? Let's go back to the defence. We're going to talk our way through the team here. We've spoken about the influence of Callum McGregor. Doesn't look as though he partakes in a bottle here or there, uh, does Callum. I mean, the guy is lean. He's a lean, mean fighting machine. Um, we'll go back to the defence, and I'm going to start with Joe Hart here. Joe Hart, um, in games against Rangers, has been a, a, a massive leader. We keep going back to it, and I think we need we do need leaders at the weekend. We've spoken why, about why, not just because of who we're playing, uh, the importance of the game, the title fight, whoever's going to be starting for Rangers. The backdrop to this game, there's, there's been big, big discussion points regarding uh, McCoist's comments, right, which uh, seem to be more acceptable than Brendan Rodgers saying good girl to mm. someone. You know, it's bonkers. Just in that, isn't that? Aye, and they, they need to be called out on it, Lloyd. They absolutely need to be called out on it. So you've got all that furore. You've got the referee um, who has been appointed to um, officiate the game. And you've got the fact that there's no Celtic fans there. All this stuff happening in the background. Um, but Callum's back and Rio's back. And Carter Vickers is back. And Kyogo's back on form. And I think, right, and listen, disagree if you feel that you, you need to. I think Joe Hart's having his best season in a Celtic jersey. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, obviously, I had a few incidents in the Champions League would have made a few mistakes but domestically wise I think he's been absolutely brilliant and obviously with the announcement that coming out that he's retiring at the end of the season this is Joe Hart's last 10 weeks hopefully as a Celtic player and hopefully he goes out with a bang and two trophies in his hands Well I, I was looking at um, his career I mean what a phenomenal career Joe Hart has had and He's another guy, if, if we go back to the episodes around Joe Hart signing for Celtic, he's another one that kind of, that, that, that sign of divided opinion. If you look mm -hmm. back on like the social media comment or or maybe the, the comments within the Axon um, uh, episodes around about that time, and even some of the contributors weren't big fans of Joe Hart coming into the club. But as we sit here, you look at the, the experience, and I know that, listen, people hit a peak and, and it's all downhill from there. But we've got a goalkeeper there with... with this level of experience, where he's got 75 caps for England, he's played in two World Cup finals, two European Championship finals. Um, he's won uh, domestic honours, every domestic honour in England, every domestic honour in Scotland. Correct me in the comments, is he the third player to have done that? I think. I think he's the third player. Yeah, Kenny Dalglish. Dalglish. Andre Kinchelskis. Kinchelskis and Joe Hart. And Joe yeah. Hart. So only three players have done it. Um, but what he's also bringing, as well as all that experience, as a leadership, that there's a there's a leadership that, that Joe Hart brings to this this football club, and I think that against strangers he has shown it time and time again. You look at that last game, and again, there, there are people within the Axon team who are not sold on Joe Hart as a goalie, um, and I thought that we win the game two one, and people focus on Tavernier's goal, the free kick. Ah, he should have saved that. He should have saved that, and I think I, I keep looking at it and go right. If he did save that, that would have been like world class. Would have been save. World class save. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, so maybe he should save it. Maybe we, we should expect that from him. However, in the first half of that game, he pulled off arguably three saves in the first half mm -hmm. that completely change, completely change the, the dynamic of that match. And he's done it several times. We, we talk about the St. Johnston save where we go up the park and score a third goal. Could it, he took it from 2 2 to 3 1, basically, right? And we talk about all of that. But in terms of the leadership and the influence, I'm also talking about incidents like the the glass in the goal mouth. You know? So you're at Ibrox and you're in a cauldron. You're in an absolute cauldron. According to Alan McCoy, it's a cauldron of hate, right? And there's glass in your goal mouth that somehow managed to appear during the halftime break. And nobody saw it appearing in the goal mouth. And no one um, was seen throwing it on the CCTV, etc., etc. But it's Joe Hart 
who puts a halt to everything, all proceedings, and says, and he's, you can tell him, he's saying to the referee, we'll walk off if mm -hmm. this doesn't get sorted. And it takes a strong, strong character. You used to see him at times running over to the touchline if there was a wall in the game, running over to Ange. And yeah, telling that, Ange, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, A, B, and C, here's my observations, and then going away back into the goal now. So I think Joe Hart, for me, is having his best season in a Celtic jersey. Whether or not you think he's deserving of the player of the year is another discussion. I've not voted yet, but it's between him and Matt O'Reilly for me. And there's no question that he's the man. And by the way, he's had that season, even though he's very rarely had the, the strongest central defence in front of him. Back four picks itself, do you agree with that? Is it the same back four that start against uh, Livingston, do you think, Lloyd? I think it should be the back four I wrote on that sheet that I sent you at the start of the week. Scary. Which was very scary. No, I'm kidding, man. Um, yeah, back four picks itself. It, it has to. It's Carter Vickers, Scales, you know what you're getting with him now this season. Any time the two of them have played together, they've been solid. Taylor, you know fine well what he does. Johnson. Johnson's the one for me that I really hope he has a solid game on Sunday. Because I think with Fabio Silva down that wing, they'll, they'll try and target Johnson with his pace. And hopefully Johnson's just ready to deal with him like he did a few other ones previous. Um, their left hand side, their right hand side, sorry. No, we all know who, who goes down that right hand side, Mr. Hall of Famer. Um, but T Taylor Mike. Are you Taylor. talking about the greatest right back in Scottish football history? What, Daniel, Daniel Fergus McGrain? Yeah, Sad I didn't... Sad sadly I'm not, but. but da um... Danny's beard is better than J James Tavernier, you know? It it's it's incredible. I would rather have Danny, Danny McGrain's beard than James Tavernier's right foot, put it that way. Yeah, I would. There was a couple of good stories about Paddy with Danny as well. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, right? Paddy, I think, has got a few, a few other events coming up. No, but you're right um, in terms of the, the defence there. And we'll talk about some of the performances because I think the one that might divide opinion, and let us know in the comments here, is Scalesy coming back in. So he's come back. It's quite clear and obvious here that when he's fit, Brendan Rodgers is playing him, Lloyd. Yeah. Yeah, yes. He that's his preferred centre back option. We've seen that all season. We don't know obviously what Navrotsky's doing so wrong or anything like that, but he only seems to be getting a place on the bench considering it was a £4 million signing. But Scales seems to be the one that Brendan fancies the most. So we don't pick the team, sadly, but Brendan does, and that's what he gets paid to do. No, you're right. And you, again, I'm going to go back to that. We don't see behind the curtain. We don't see under mm -hmm. the bonnet, as they say. We don't know what's happening at Lennox Town on a daily basis. What's he seeing from Lager Bielka and Mike Novoshke? What's he seeing day to day? Well, whatever he's seeing, he's not impressed. Because no. these guys are, are not featuring. They are on a bench for cover. Uh, you know, that at best, that's what they're doing. Um, interestingly enough, though, <laughs> Mike Novoshke was in the brazen head. Yesterday? Yes, I seen or the that. day before. Did you see that? Yeah, I seen that video. That was quite. Um, I'm sure we had a player that done something similar like that before. I can't remember his name though. But he wore a cracking top. He did wear a top. Talking of which, I was gifted a Celtic top last night uh, from your good self because I, I, oh, yeah. I, I said that I, I'm not a big fan of the home jersey, right? And I've said it for the, the moment I've seen it. Um, and, and look, I'm not an authority on, on jerseys, but obviously I, I've done a lot of research over the years and there's certain things that I look for in a Celtic jersey. And I don't want broken hoops, right? And I don't want squiggly hoops that look more like crocodile shoes than, than hoops. I don't want any of that stuff, right? I think the badge should always be full colour, unless you do something like the, the white one, which we never wore for some bizarre reason, because that looked absolutely stunning. I would love the hoops never to have a sponsor, but that's not going to happen. But you can buy the jerseys without a sponsor. Uh, th these types of things. And, and you need to have five, at least five. I think the Lisbon jersey had seven hoops. But Lisbon you jersey had seven hoops. Then the Hollow yeah. 25th had nine hoops, I believe. Nine, yeah. Nine. So, to be, to be honest with you, I, I love the 125th one. I think that's literally the perfect Celtic strip. The nine hoops makes it nice and classy, long-sleeved, round white collar. Can't go any wrong. Simplicity is genius, and they did they did a thing with a sponsor where you could barely see it. It was like yeah, white on white. Right. So yeah, listen, these are the things that you discuss at the, at the weekend. I couldn't really care less what we're wearing as long as we win a game. I would actually have an all black kit that I wore against Rangers. That's what I would do, just to remind to, to, to commit 
Kaveri that um, they're no longer the same club. Yeah. Is that what you're trying I, to say I, there, Paul John? I would do that. I, I would do that. I would do that as well. That's a, 100%. That's a to me. Why not? And I bet you, you know, if, if we ran a charity on that, all takings it would sell. By, I'll buy it. it would buy I'll it happily buy it. it. Just say it now. Just like you did with that T-shirt. Barnerfield T-shirt, there you go, in the style of the old Barrowlands uh, down the Gallagher. Um Gordon Coney will be watching the game in Gracie's, and I'm pretty sure it will be rammed, as it was last night. Always a great mm-hmm. night in there. Smell the glove. I purposely didn't watch the 1-0 game. Look at that image. There's something about a Celtic player in mid-flight. It just looks immense. There's it just a similar, looks class. Oh, it looks but It's George McCluskey celebrating that goal we spoke about earlier, by the way, in the 1980 Scottish Cup final. But there's another one of Bobby Murdoch, and he's celebrating a goal, I think, against Leeds United. Right? Yes. He's, he's yes, mid you know. There's another one of Billy McNeil celebrating a goal against Rangers, and there's four different Celtic players all in mid-flight at different parts of I love it. I don't know what it is. It just looks phenomenal. But yeah, that George McCluskey one, brilliant smell of love. But you didn't watch the 1-0 game at Ibrox in September. Uh, you might do the same. You're very superstitious. Listen, mate, if it works for you, absolutely go for it. I'm superstitious as well. But if there's a Celtic game on, Lloyd, I've got to watch it. I don't know. I think that if I don't watch it, then it's almost as if I can't play a part in it, even though I know I'm not playing a part in it. But you know, it, it you've got like to watch it. Aye, it feels like there's just something missing if you don't watch it because yeah. you can't sit on your phone or you'd be walking well, up and down pacing yourself all day not watching it. It's, you have to, yeah. Listen, if smell if that does it for smell the glove, fair dues. But I'm sorry, I'm sitting down watching it. I, I couldn't to. do that. Lloyd is watching it. He's getting the pies in. He's getting the bovril in. We've got a few people in the comment section telling you that how dare you appear on a Scottish football podcast? <laughs> you never tasted bovril. <laughs> Big reds. I- I'll blame my dad for that. Well, listen, we're introducing it to you. You can do the same to the wee fella. Big Reds uh, heading to Lawrence Connolly's bar. Has it been named? Thanks for last night, Paul John. God bless. It was great to see you, Big Reds. Uh, as always, I hope you enjoyed it. And enjoy Lawrence Connolly's bar as well on Sunday. Uh, hopefully you have a few sherbets and enjoy the aftermath as well. I can see that if we win the game, that it might be a three or a four day bender. That yeah, definitely could be. Yeah, Why that not? could be. That could Why be not? the new. That could be another Gracie's where it'd be <laughs> rampacked. Lawrence is going to be calling it in for a few days after that one, right? Maestro ninety five. In fact, he might miss Tuesday's show. Maestro ninety five. Marmite is book. You know what? There you go. Right. You've never tasted bovril. I've never tasted marmite. I've never tasted my either. Yeah, no. There you go. Uh, Paul McQuaid, uh, great to hear you. <laughs> never had a bovril. Get him off the football pod. Get him off. Absolutely. <laughs> You've got to taste it. Uh, Sorry, Lee, Paul. Lee. Well, the first bovril was from the pie shop next to the old jungle. The old jungle, you know. Oh, wow. You know, I do feel sorry a wee bit for um, the kind of newer generation. I don't look down on them because I think what they've got is that is with modern stadiums, they've got the safety aspect of it, Lloyd, which, you know, when you think back to some stadiums, they were not safe. I mean, uh, I remember being at Fur Park once and my feet didn't touch the ground leaving. And I'm not exaggerating. You know, your shoulder, 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 you just go. Maybe my signal has disappeared a wee, for a wee second or so, but I'm yep. back. I'm May. back. I'm back. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm messaging to make sure everybody off the Wi-Fi don't. Get back into it. And in the meantime, um, if I do disappear, Lloyd will be uh, filling in the blanks as well because the Wi-Fi is taking a battering. Don't know who's uh, responsible for that. Uh, Joseph McGonagall, watching it with my grandson and daughter at the Plymouth CSC. Joseph, that is tremendous. There's a few Plymouth Celtic fans come in to the, the comment section. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so enjoy that, Joseph. Send us a photo on the old social media. As well. There's Feed the Bear. He's saying, Paul, go and get yourself some decent Wi-Fi. Hail, hail, <laughs> hoops, troops. Thank you very much, my man. Good to see you. I hope everything is going well. Um, and Alex is claiming that he's actually enjoying a little bovril right now. He's having it now. He says, sorry about that. I don't know what the situation is there with the, the signal dropping out, but it's something I'll look into to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, Brendan, you'll be watching the game 
uh, behind your city with your votary beats. Well, hopefully, a wee bit like Jim Moore, we get a three-goal lead and you can enjoy the rest of the game. Brendan, Red Scotland, salt and pepper in the Bovril is the bollocks. There you go, Lloyd. Oh, well, you're, getting, you go. you're getting all the tips. Right, so we're talking Joe Hart, Alistair Johnson, Greg Taylor, and then in the central defensive area, Carter Vickers and Liam Scales. Um, we've spoken at times this season about uh, the left-hand side being targeted. Um, is that still an issue, do you think? Scales and Taylor? They always seem to... Every team seems to still target Taylor, and I think they're starting to click on it now a little bit. And I think Scales is doing a really good job in covering when Taylor goes forward. But with Sunday, I, I think they'll, they'll try and target Taylor again. But there's someone in front of Greg Taylor who... I think he's able to deal with helping him out in that. I think so. I think he's absolutely key. Um, Dyson made that again. We were talking last night about what makes a, a cult player. And, um, you know, sometimes it's the style. Sometimes it's the relationship with the fans. Sometimes it's their approach to the game. Um, either full-blooded without the talent, loads of talent. Maybe likes are too much of a bevy. The gambling, the womanising, all that stuff. A uh, wee bit overweight. I mean, the idol, idol was Andy Ritchie. At Greenock Morton started off at Celtic actually under Jock's team. Um, uh, never really that fit, always carried a bit of weight, slight a wee smoke, all that kind of stuff. But you give him a football, you give him a football, and the man was a magician. Um, that That is the very epitome of a cult hero. And I think, and I've said this before in our team right now, and in modern days, we've had guys like Paddy, we've had guys like Samaras, yeah. the, 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 the talented player that divided opinion. Couldn't be bothered sometimes against Ross County. That, that you know, that's what Neil Lennon said. Sometimes he did not fancy it against the smaller teams. Yeah, you but, could see it as well when they played. Yeah, and I think that's what frustrated a lot of people with him. But absolutely, I, yeah. I love, I love Big Samaras. Really did. It was the way he would bring a ball down from he, the air on the chest. He was a, he was a Jesus lookalike for he me. Was, uh, that's all. That's what done it for me. Just a Jesus lookalike. Great hair as well. Right. But the, the man who is the cult hero in this team is, is Dyson Mayra. And, and I think his main role, not his only role at the weekend, like you say, is just to nullify any threat. But how do you nullify it? That's the question. You don't do it in the back foot. You you give you give Maeda the opportunity to press. Yeah. And you press to have in your because listen, you can talk all day about his goal scoring record and his dead ball um ability and all this kind of stuff. You can't defend. No, and you can't you, but that's his first job, defending. Yep. And he can't Press do it. Him. He can't do it. Get right Press up him. in his face. Absolutely. Press my head beat my Ada beats him for pace every day of the week. Yeah. But I and think he generally hates coming up against him. I think you're right. I think you're right. And and Maeda's not just in the team because of his defensive qualities. I mean, obviously he scored a hat trick this season, he scored uh three goals, missed three chances that, that day as well. And I always go back to the um the assist for Jota's header against Rangers where everybody stops except him. His reaction's incredible. Um, I think it's a two-touch move where he gathers the ball with one foot and he crosses it with another and, and yeah. he spins on a sixpence. Um, and it was it was a pinpoint perfect pass uh, and, and cross to Jota who scores scores the header. So there's more to made his game than the work rate and you know the battery engine and all that kind of stuff, the Duracell battery. He has got a bit of football about him. And I think that's what's frustrating at times because when he does something basic and he does it wrong and he'll cross a ball into the into the stand, that's frustrating because you know that he can do it. Yeah, that, that's can. the bit. That's yeah. the bit. And I, I, I do know that Harry Kuehl was doing a lot of work with the wingers when he was here. Um, and it seemed to benefit them. You know, it did benefit the wingers. I think that there's a lot to be said for that. Um, there's certain things. I don't look like a, a player like um, Dyson made and think he's a finished article. I really don't, Lloyd. I don't think, right, there's certain aspects of his game that are rubbish and they're always going to be rubbish. I think he can fine-tune them. Yeah. Now, you know... It needs, it needs coached in him, I yeah, think. Absolutely. I, I think that's all it is. And but, people disagree with that. People do disagree with that. But I think the examples I've been given um, is guys like Scott Brown, right? Did Scott Brown improve under Brendan Rodgers when Brendan Rodgers came uh, to the club in the first, the first instance? Well, I would say he did. I, I, did Callum McGregor improve? A wee bit younger, of course. Did Callum McGregor improve? I think he did. So there were players who were already established who can improve under a manager regardless of their age. And there are certain aspects of a game that you can improve. Can you improve your crossing quality? Of course you can mm -hmm. with practice. It doesn't matter if you're 26 or 16 or 6. If you practice, you can improve on it. 
So I, th- I think he can still be fine tuned. I still think he can improve as a player. Dyson Mida. I know that that Liam um, Carrigan thinks that he still still believes that he's a centre forward rather than a winger, and, he, and he's constantly playing out of position. But I think he's going to be huge. Now on the on the other side, then uh, we've got obviously Nicholas Kuhn and Yang. Some people might think there's not a decision to be made there. What's your take on it? The last few times, obviously, Yang was suspended and we've only really seen him come back for the Livingston game there. But he was starting to come in a good bit of form before he, he was sent off against Hearts. Kuhn, as well, though, he's got his chance and he's grabbed it. And in a player's playing like that, you can't not just drop him on that basis. For me, Kuhn has to start because and I, oh, I hope to God Barris explodes. I really do, because I think Kuhn would just run at him all day long. It Kuhn actually does remind me a bit of Paddy Roberts. Yeah. No, no, I'm watching when I'm watching. It's just that that early kind of Paddy Roberts when he was just starting to find his feet a bit at Celtic, and then he just kicked on, and once again it was under Brendan Rodgers. It was, and um, I think Brendan Rodgers has been quite uh, keen to to claim the signings in January, um, and and Kuhn. As I said to you, and it happened on Axon, and it happened on the social media channels, Kuhn was written off very, very early on. And I think as football fans that we've all been guilty of that in the past. Um, you think of a player that you've written off and, you know, they come back and, and prove you wrong. You want to be proved wrong. But a lot of people are writing off Kuhn. Um, but I do think there's a similarity, not just in his, his style of play, the way he carries himself, the way he runs, the way he looks as well. And if he can replicate any, any kind of... Um, the flair and the assists and the goals that Paddy Roberts scored for Celtic, you know, I'll be I'll be delighted. Paddy Roberts could have signed for Celtic under Ange Postecoglou. I always find that an interesting one. So he's obviously been on our radar anyway because we've got eighteen months of data um, whilst he was at the club, so we know that what he's capable of. Um, and then he became available for for purchase, and he was a player that Ange Postecoglou spoke to, um, and didn't think that he fitted. He fitted in, and um, so that that's interesting because that that would have been in, in season one under Ange. Um, listen, it's not going to happen now. You don't pine for him, but Kuhn, I, I agree with you. I think there are similarities there, and he plays Yang on the bench is a absolutely brilliant option, though. Like, yeah. When you think oh, about yeah, the form he was in, where does it leave some of the others then? Right, so Palmer completely out of the picture through injury. Um, people are maybe quick to criticise him as well, but. I think this comes not down to ability. I think it comes down to mentality with Palmer. Yeah, it possibly does. But and this is where Alan Morrison would be perfect. He would get the stats out and say, "Well, Palmer's creating so many goals and scoring so many goals in so many minutes a game." So he is playing a key part in game, but it just doesn't look as if he's fully performing at his best for the full ninety minutes. It it seems to me Palmer doesn't like tracking back no. now and again, and I think that. But going forward, he can create something out of nothing. So once again, that's a good option to have on the bench for me. So for me, in the fact I've seen him training this morning behind McGregor in the picture, that's it just seems like everything's clicking into place. Just for this just for this game, because the squad to me now is looking the way it should have been looking at the start of the season. When we were all kind of mumping and groaning performances isn't great. Seeing Sunday, I couldn't care about performance. See if Celtic win two, three, nothing on Sunday, and it's the worst performance ever. I'll be happy. Take it. The thing with Palmer being on the bench, right? I, I just think that he's a player that has shown ability this season. I mean, he scored in the Champions League. Um, he's got a really good goals and assists rate when you look at per minute uh, for goal contributions. But there's other aspects of his game. Again, going back to him that he needs to work on to improve. And I think going into that game, if you've got made on the left, giving us everything that we've discussed. And you've got Kuhn, who's the in-form right winger on the right-hand side. A bit unfair on Yang, but you know he was suspended and Kuhn stepped up. You're looking at that bench and you think, with Palma on it, you're covered both sides. And you're thinking, you know, maybe in the last 15, 20 minutes, if you want to bring on Yang and Palma or Forrest and Palma, double switch, and you're running at two guys who have maybe already been knackered out by Kuhn and, and Maeda, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And like you say, at a key time, this is this is coming to fruition. Not that long ago, um, we were looking ahead to the Rangers game, Lloyd, and we were saying, right, who do you play up top? 
I don't think there's a question now, is there? Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's again. also he's also in Seagrass <laughs> Motor. They're sharing a car. Absolutely. Um, no, 100%, Kyogo. People are going to get fed up with me saying the word 100%. That's all I've been saying so far. No, Kyogo, it has to start. Because it, we've seen on Sunday, and obviously this is where Hatati can come in. Hatati and Kyogo just seem to have that key relationship where they always find each other. And that, to me, is going to be key on Sunday. Kyogo yeah. will run them ragged all day. And as most defenders and most players in Scotland, if you've ever spoke, listen to any other podcast of that, they always say the hardest person to play against is Kyogo because he just runs down, runs the wing all the time. Nobody can keep up with him. He's always on that shoulder. So if that's the way we're going to play on Sunday, then it has to be Kyogo. But once again, he does not a bad option to come off the bench as well because well, he can, he can change the game up. It can be Absolutely a bit more physical. Yeah. So that's, that's another thing as well. We, the game plan can change in-game. And we've seen this before with Brendan Rodgers, where he's done that. And I still can't believe that he put, brought Edward on for that 3-2 game. But he did, and look how it paid off. So, once again, the options on the bench are just got to be as key as what the starting 11 is. I think it was Brendan Rodgers that said that. You know, the final 30 minutes is as important as, as your starting 11. And when you look at options, and, and you think, right, if McGregor doesn't play, and Awata or Bernardo, and I think it'll be... Awata, but something's telling me that you know Brennan Rogers likes Bernardo in the big games and he's shown that he can he can perform in the big games. So it wouldn't surprise me either way. I want McGregor in there, of course, but it's options, isn't it? You've got you're, we're talking about three guys here, two of them are going to be on the bench. You're then talking about maybe Palmer being back in on the bench on the right hand side, Yang, Forrest, great options. Defensively, we don't have the same cover for me. We don't have the same quality, right? So Tony Ralston, I'm happy with Tony Ralston as a backup, always have been. I think um, on the left-hand side, Brennan Rogers has said that his backup left-back now is Liam Scales. So that's why we've been running with two central defenders on the bench, right? So you've got somebody covering in case Scales gets injured, somebody covering in case Taylor gets injured and Scales needs to move over, or, or Carter Vickers, of course. But I think in terms of the backup, it's not as clear-cut with your centre-halves. Brennan Rogers seems to favour Stephen Welsh, mm-hmm. but... It wouldn't surprise me if he tries to fit two central defenders on the bench. So we might not have as many offensive players as we're expecting. Um, and up top, Ida, again, didn't do a lot wrong, Ida, did he? No. But when Kyogo got the opportunity, he just grasped it. So I do feel a wee bit for Ida, but I think that as an option on the bench, uh, absolutely brilliant. And, and I've said it before, I think that he gives you... Uh, something similar to what Yakimakis gives you, not just the physicality, just the way that he stretches the back line. Um, and going back to your point about Kyogo and, and the runs and uh, having somebody in the midfield who can pick out th- those runs and quickly is key. And that guy is Hattati, of course, because Kyogo was becoming so frustrated. You could see him. He was still getting into the space, putting the arm up. There was a, a great camera angle where it, it seen him. It, it, caught, it captured him in the centre circle, Lloyd. Yeah, he was making run that. after run after run. Nobody was picking him out. Um, so it's maybe not the forte of uh, someone like Awata, but Hatati can certainly do that. A couple of minutes to go. I want people in the comments to tell me how they're feeling about Sunday and what is your, your prediction. Cell 88 still on the Bovril. He says paste is minging. The cups with the dried powder are decent, though, Lloyd, and you can definitely get them um, in the superstores. Being a 24-7 professional is not for everyone, Marquee. Yeah, we're going back to that guy at Time Castle using the grease from the pie to flavour the bovril. Absolutely brilliant. Don't like bovril from the jar. David, the worst thing about bovril for the jar, once you shut it, you can't open it. It sticks like glue, <laughs> like cement. And um, Here we go. And we Bree, my first bovril, I, I, listen, I brought that up twice now, it was from the pie shop next to the jungle. I'm reminiscing about the jungle. Um, Dr. Melfi, if Callum is fit, then he must play from the start. I need a prediction from you now, Lloyd. You're going to be the last voice on a Celtic state of mind until the pre-match preview half an hour before kick-off. What's your prediction? How do you see it going? It's going to be a beautiful Sunday. That's all I'll say. You're not going to commit to your score, goal scorers, nope. minutes, standings off. I'll commit. Goals. I'll commit to it. I'll need two Celtic goals to win the game. Right. I said that we're going to have to get the ball in the net three times to get two goals. I think Celtic will score two goals. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I, I've, I've said, and I'm not sure I said it on here or privately, I think it may be two each. I think mm-hmm. it may be two each. And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is a lot of it will come down to the decisions that are made by the officials. It will. Yeah. That's we will what be I, talking. Yeah. That's what I don't want the game to become about is the officials and VAR and all that nonsense because we've heard enough of that this week and we know where the game's getting played and everything and we know the patterns of assistance and what the SFA and all that. The main thing is, if we go into that pitch and do what we do, we win. Simple I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, I, I think that there's going to be some controversy um, and we'll be talking about it. I would much rather not talk about it, but I'm not quite sure. Some predictions coming in. Jimmy Boy reckons one nothing Kyogo. Take that. Would, wouldn't surprise me and I would take it all day long. Opinionated Glaswegian 3-1 Celtic. JJ Celtic has got a fiver on Celtic to win 3-1. Fair play on there and feed the bear 2-1 to Celtic with a penalty for Tavernier. Wouldn't surprise me either, feed the bear. No, it wouldn't surprise me either. We'll be back at 11.30, um, bef- well, half an hour before the kickoff. Um, and I'll be joined by Kevin McCluskey. We'll, we'll have, uh, I'll certainly be having a bobro on the occasion as well. Just uh, I hope that I hope that Lloyd does as well. Thanks everybody for last night. Um, it was brilliant to to meet a lot of you you guys uh, that tune in. It really is a pleasure uh, to be in among Celtic fans and and get an XL in there. I've got a big meeting next week actually. We we have venue in Glasgow, so hopefully we'll have some more news on uh, Axon getting out on the roads and bringing as many XLs as we possibly can. Some new blood as well would be good um, and get them out to to meet and greet the Celtic supporters. I'm going to see Celtic are going to score two goals. I hope it is 2-1. I hope Feed the Bears right. Um, would it surprise me if Rangers get a late decision? Um, no. But uh, these are the things that we will deal with and we will discuss on Sunday. Thank you, every single one of you, for getting involved today. Uh, well over 14, 1,500. And all that's left for me to say, Lloyd, thanks for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. No problem. <laughs>